um, that I, I heard this week um, about a new Christian who was learning to follow the Spirit. I hope it encourages you. In the story, the, the gentleman was a middle-aged man who found, who found the gospel later in life. And he was telling a story to a gentleman who was interviewing him. And in the interview, he, he, let, he laid out the story. He said, well, I was just recently saved. I don't really know much. But I knew that I wanted to follow the leading of the Spirit. That's what the Scripture says. I wanted to follow where God wanted me to go. And he said, one day I was driving down the road, and I was praying that God, even on this drive, if you need me, lead me. Now, I don't know if you guys ever pray that, but if you do, be, be mindful that he may answer that prayer that you prayed. And along the way, the man is driving, and he sees this guy on the side of the road who's like a hitchhiker or whatever. He's a guy that's backpacked and walking. And as he passes him, he feels a nudge in his spirit that he can't get away from, that he's supposed to go back and get that guy. And he's like, no, that's a, I don't, I mean, that's must not. And, but he still can't get away from it. He's just wrestling. With it. So he, he says, why? Well, and I don't know if you guys have these here. So this is actually an American story. Um, there's these little cuts sometimes where it's meant for emergency vehicles to be able to cut through on different parts of the road. He's like, well, I pulled through one of those. I know one's supposed to be said, but if God was leading me, I'd be okay. <laughs> and so he pulls through one of them, and, which helps him turn around and go pick up this guy. And so he picks the guy up, and he, he, he said, I'll, I'll, I'll take you to where you need to go. And as they're driving up the road, um, he felt the Spirit nudge him to ask about belief, about God. And he said, I know. He said, he said, okay. And he's like, well, I didn't know the words. You know, God didn't give me the words. He said, knew what he didn't feel like he needed to do. And so he said, he looks over at the guy and goes, Joe, um, do you believe in spiritual things? And uh, the guy kind of gets a weird look on his face and goes, I can't believe you asked me that question. Now, of course, this new believer is, is bracing himself. He's like, uh oh, what have, I, what have I done? Have I upset this guy? Or what's going to happen? And he got, the, the guy scrunches up his face and says, I was walking down that road that you picked me up on. He said, I've lost everything but what's on my back. I've hit rock bottom and the lowest I've ever been. I've lived my life not believing in God. He said, but I'm desperate. And so while I was walking, I looked up to the sky and said, God, if you are real, send one of your believers by to tell me about you. And he looked over at the guy driving and said, are you that believer? And the guy said, and he, and he said yes, and started telling him about the gospel, and the guy got saved. And so I tell you is, if you are willing to be open, he is willing to lead you. But I don't know about you, because um, some of you may not have farm, farm experience. I'm, I, I'm generally well put together, but I also have a little bit of Southern American boy in me. Um, I've dealt with some, some very, uh, various animals in my life. Um, but some animals, I don't know if you've ever dealt with them, are kind of hard-headed and don't want to always be led where you want them to go. And sometimes you have to pull. But what's amazing is when you get an animal that listens to you and you're able just to gently pull that little rope and they're able to follow where you want them to go. What is, a lot of times is we as believers don't want to be led. We like to be in control. We like to know the next step. We like to know where we're going. But it's amazing when we allow ourselves to be led by the Spirit, what He's able to do, that's surpassing what we thought anyway. Because we gave Him space. We gave Him room. We gave the Spirit of God able to, to, to move through us and to show us something better. Um, what's powerful, like I said, is the, the triune God can do that for us. Um, and uh, I thought that was worth mentioning on Trinity Sunday, as the church calendar talks about. You see in this passage, we see the, like I said, the, the Trinitarian, the, the, the three-in-one formula of God in verse 19. You see, the Trinity is revealed most clearly through the earthly ministry of Jesus. God the Son was empowered by the Spirit to obey and glorify the Father. What's powerful is we get that in Scripture, the story, of, uh, once again, of Jesus' prophecy that led up to the Son of God and a snippet of His life. And what's powerful is that is how we ourselves can live our lives. While we are not perfect, while the Son was empowered by the Spirit to obey and glorify the Father, we ourselves can be empowered by the Spirit to obey and glorify the Father. As Sarah talked about with being an image bearer, we are able to follow Him. And in that obedience, we are able to be led to minister in whatever way God opens the door, once again, in the ways of baptism, discipleship, teaching, or in other ways not mentioned here in Scripture. You see in the Great Commission, the history of this Trinity and the obedience of Christ are passed on to us for all of us are called once again to do the work of the gospel 
and to spread the good news. What's powerful is we are able, when we are empowered by Him, to do just what we're called to do. Um, Something I, I wanted to share with you that might help you daily is taking a look in the mirror and saying this, God's timing, not mine. God's plan, not mine. God's will, not mine. God's glory, not mine. God's word, not this world's. It's a good thing to think I have to daily remind you to have the right focus. Because as you have the right focus, He'll make the right way that needs to happen. Like I said, what's powerful is the intention that God had um, in us as believers, but also in us as a people. In Acts chapter 17, verse 26 through 28, it says, And He has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for Him and find Him, though He is not far from each one of us. For in Him we live and move and have our being. As one also, some of your own poets have said, for we are also His offspring. What's powerful here is I'm not telling you you are called to change the whole world. I think we're a bit hyperbolic as humans. Pastor Luke, I can't do those huge things. I'm not Moses. I can't lead a... Well, yeah, maybe you're not called to, to lead that way. But what's powerful here in the Scripture reminds us that God determined the time and boundaries of our dwellings. That basically means you're not here by accident. You are alive in this time in history for a purpose. And the life that you, the years you've led up to this, you were born when you were supposed to be born. You were purposed in that way. But what I love here is that Scripture doesn't just talk about that, but talks about the boundaries of their dwellings. Do you know what that means? Because if, you're, if you don't think about it, you might miss it is that just like you might own, or you might rent, but it doesn't matter, but think about an owner of a piece of land. You might own the house and the tract of land it sits on. But there are different sizes of tracts of land. Just like as you look in different parts of the world, countries and area, there are divisors. There are counties. There are cities. There are, you name the way that the world can be divided, it's divided into pieces. And what's crazy about that is there's different sizes of those pieces. Which means God's not calling you to everything. It's not you to save the whole world. I often prayed those prayers and God would often uh, pat, pat, gently kind of pat me like, it's okay, son, you're not meant to, call, not meant to save everybody. But go where I lead you. Say what I tell you to. I've always determined that if I do that, it all works itself out. And what's, I think, a powerful thing for us is we are called to the same. Which is also interesting here to, to, to be reminded that our hope is found in Him. And as we live and move and have our being in Him, it takes care of all those things I mentioned earlier. All the unclaimed spaces of the world, whether they're, once again, claimed or unclaimed for, for, for right or wrong reasons, but also in ourselves. It means in the places of our hearts, our emotions, our minds, and our spiritual well-being we're able to once again more give those things to Him. I, uh, I read a book on fasting once, and one of the chapters always stuck with me was Dethroning King Stomach. It's a kind of a funny title. You can smile. It's okay about it. You know, I know you're all very serious. You can just smile about it. It's okay. But the thing is, it's the reminder that in fasting, we are reminded to put who in charge? The King of Kings. We're putting God in charge because we're able to give up something physical even to Him. And so that's once again, it's a reminder that in the pieces of our lives, we need to give Him the room and space to be God in all the aspects of who we are. Um, I remember one time, Sarah and I have moved for different times of ministry, that we were, uh, Sarah was having a moment, and you could tell she was struggling, but she didn't know what to say. And I looked at her and I said, if God wants us there, He'll take us there but we have to be willing to go there. This wasn't even about Scotland. This is another time and time in life. I told her, and, so, and she knew early on in our relationship that if we were going to make our marriage work, we were going to follow God. 
There wasn't any and or but there. And when we had children one day, we would lead them in godly things because that was what we were called to do. Um, as I end today, I, uh, it's amazing, uh, like I, I, taught, I shared with you guys a few weeks ago, my oldest, Lily, uh, who's eight, almost nine, has asked me, and we've had various talks, and I'm sure we'll have more. She's a very inquisitive little girl, but asked about how, Daddy, what do you, how do you determine what to preach? How do you prepare that for the adults? We've had various talks about it. Um, and one thing I told her was, well, you, you get to listen to God a lot, baby. You get to do what God tells you to. You've got to study His Word, and you know, God, God helps you. And, you know. um, and in doing so, I was reminded this week of that conversation because of what I'm going to share and end with service today, which is a dream that I had. And I hope you believe, because the Bible talks about them, that, that we can be spoken to in dreams. And I want to tell you my dream I had right now. And that I said what I said about Lily, though, because, you know, often when someone shares something, you know, I'm like, you know, am I going to share this and is it going to be accepted? But I'm like, well, if it's what God wants me to share, it's not up to me for you to accept it. I'm just the person who speaks the word. What you do with it is between you and God. So in my dream, I was in a gymnasium. I don't know if those are things here. Place where you have physical education class inside. Big gymnasium area. Forgive me if I don't mean to speak down. I'm just making sure you know what I'm talking about. That was the kind of room I was in. And actually, specifically, um, I was in uh, the, my high school's gym. So my secondary school's gymnasium. What I found interesting, though, about this was, was in the dream, there was no roof. The ceiling was gone. It was open to sky. But no one around me seemed to notice they were running and they were playing games and they were exercising and running around. But I, I felt like I was just alone in this room but full of people. And as I looked up and noticed that there was no roof, there was a light that emanated from above. And I knew in the dream that this was it was time that God was calling the it was the end and God was calling those that he you know that had been saved to heaven. And that there was some scripture that was quoted, but I don't need to quote that that's not the purpose for this this part, but I, I heard the scripture quoted, and then all of a sudden I felt myself raise, and I watched as a few people also throughout this crowd were raised as well. And I found myself in the throne room of heaven was already humbling enough. And I, but as I looked around, I don't know if any of you have ever been in a really big crowd before, concert, whatever, you know, a place where there's lots of people. I noticed that throughout the crowd, there were holes where no one was standing. And the scripture was quoted, you know, uh, Every knee will bow and everyone will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so I watch as everyone starts to bow. And I felt myself bow, but I held back for a second. And as, I, as people are starting to bow, I even more clearly see, and I'm drawn to these holes and these spaces. And I go, God, why are there holes? This is heaven. This is about completeness. What, what's going on? And in the clearest voice I'd ever heard that still shakes me to this day, and I'll tell you why, God said, these are the people that you should have spoke to that you didn't talk to. And they missed heaven because of you. And you're like, that's a little bit intense. But, and I'm not telling you what, where the theology and the scriptures, but I want you to hear me in this because I, what I'm going to tell you right now is those holes in heaven as it stuck with me, I dreamed that dream 15 plus years ago. But it was brought to my remembrance these last couple of days as I prepared to remind you of this, that your words, that your actions, they're important. That in your call of life, you're not called to win the whole world, but you're called to be obedient that you're called to listen, that you're called to go where He tells you to go. And it may just be up the street to your neighbor who might need to hear the gospel. It might be the person in the grocery store, or it might be across the world like my family and I have gone. But what I tell you is this, you are important to the gospel. 
before you say, well, I don't have it all together, Pastor Luke. It doesn't matter if you have it all together. You could be like that newly saved person who was just mindful enough of what he'd been taught to listen and to be led when God spoke. Now, I'm not saying that it's going to be your fault if there's someone missing from heaven. You're missing my point if that's what your focus is. My focus is to remind you that I was reminded as a kid, and by the way, just to do some math, I had this dream when I was in secondary school, and God brought it back to remembrance in my 30s, is that you are capable at any age of following the gospel. Because when I had that dream 15 plus years ago, and from that point to this day, what has guarded and guided my heart in my time with my Savior and with my God is that I'm going to give what I have to Him. I'm going to give Him my marriage one day, which of course now I'm living that, 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 that promise I promised Him. That I'm going to give my kids to Him, and I had that promise when I was in secondary school. That I'm going to give my time, my energy, my knowledge, my ability, but I'm also giving my lack of those things too. When I don't have the ability, God will give you where I, 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 I'm, I'm lacking here. I'm lacking here. You're going to have to feel that with you. And knowing that I'm going to follow when He leads. Which brings me back to the reminder of what I want to remind you is God's timing, not yours. God's plan, not yours. God's will, not yours. God's glory, not yours. God's word, not the world's or even what you tell yourself. Every head will please bow. and Every eye will close. Nobody looking around. As we go into our altar time today, I want to encourage you that where you find yourself today, maybe you need to claim your place where God wants you to be. That phrase, by the way, is a quote, is a an idea, an idea from Luke chapter 14, verse 8, verse through 11, which we, so we can talk about later more if you want to. But I want you to focus right now in this time of prayer and meditation to God that maybe today you need to be mindful about is there a place in your own life that you're giving up, that you're giving to someone else, the devil, other time. But also the bigger picture that I want to encourage you is that you are an ambassador who makes room for him. Like I prayed for Sally and for Maxwell and their birthday blessings. That you as a believer, as a Christian, as a follower, a disciple, as a bearer of the gospel, that you make room for Christ everywhere you go. Because the world's going to claim space. The powers of darkness, as we know in Scripture, will claim their place if we don't let them. Sorry, rather, if we do let them. And so what I'm saying is today... You need to gird yourself up. Be reminded of that Sunday school lesson of the armor of God. That you would be ready and willing to fight and to be led by your, your, your general, if you will, in heaven. As I say this prayer in just a minute for you, I want you to pray that God speaks to you now where you can give Him more of yourself, but also where God can lead you in the coming days, weeks, months, and years of your life that you would do your part in claiming either the unclaimed spaces or claiming back from the enemy things he thought he took from you. So again, say, Father God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your word that encourages us, God, but also chastens us. Your word that speaks life to us, God, in every season. God, I pray right now for my brothers and my sisters of every age and time of life in this room that, God, you would help us to examine ourselves further, that we, God, would give to you whatever spaces we've given away to someone else or to even the enemy because we've not let it be laid claim by you or even things that we've selfishly held close to our chest because we wanted to have something that we thought was ours to be in control. Let us release and make room for you in our hearts, in our minds, in our emotions, in our actions, our words, and every part of what makes us us. Let us make room for you. 
But God, I pray today that my brothers and sisters, no matter where they find themselves in their walk with Christ, which means they may not always get it perfect and right, but the fact if they are able to be obedient, your spirit will lead and guide them in the perfect way the spirit can do. And God, I pray that my brothers and sisters are today led by the spirit to claim spaces back for the kingdom of God to claim back their homes, to claim back their marriages, to claim back their parenting and their children because the devil wants to take them out, but they're not the devil's, they're yours. God, I pray that we claim and take back our grandchildren. God, that we take back our workplaces, that we take back our city, and that, God, we take back Scotland. This country will not die on our watch. I don't care what statistics say about the churches and the closures. I don't care what it says about the the number of Christians that is nose diving because you, God, will still have reign and your will on earth as is in heaven, which means on that scripture, I release freedom from heaven to those that need freedom and those that need life that think that they have lost all hope. We will be hope bearers to them. We will be life speakers to them. We will bear the light because we are called to be salt and light in this world and we will take it to wherever you take us, Father. Through England, through Scotland, through Wales, through Ireland and Northern Ireland, throughout all of Europe, through the rest of this world, God, I claim that wherever you take us, Father, on holiday or in movement or in any way, God, we'll take back our neighborhoods and places that we live, our streets, our cities, our areas, our councils and highland places. God, you'll let us take back and claim them for your kingdom and for to make you Lord over. God, be Lord of our lives, be Lord of our country. God, I thank you for all you are doing and all you have done, but for the miracles that you are still to do in this land, in our families, in our lives, and in the, our communities, Father. God, I thank you, God, and ask us all in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Um, we're going to have our, our time of offering now. Um, if anyone needs prayer before we close today, though, while I'm having our, our offering worship song, um, please do come to the altar. You can pray by yourself. I can pray over you and with you if you'd like. Um, this front row, of course, is open if you need to come kneel or sit and have some time of prayer right now. Um, but let's uh, worship Him with our giving together.